Thank you, Fran, and uh, good evening. Uh, tonight's lecture is going to go a little farther afield than we normally do by focusing on uh, southern uh, Mexico and Guatemala. And we're doing so because we are so fortunate and pleased to have two major Mesoamerican archaeologists agree to give a talk this evening. Uh, their research has really helped us transform our understanding of early ritual structures and sacred landscape in southern Mesoamerica. And they've done this by using really cutting edge technology, which you'll hear about tonight. Dr. Takeshi Anamata and Dr. Daniela Triaden are professors of anthropology in the School of Anthropology at the University of Arizona. And Dr. Anamata has spent uh, decades uh, doing incredibly important research in Mesoamerica, which you'll hear about tonight, the most recent work. Uh, Dr. Daniela Triaden has also done really critical work in Mesoamerica, but most of you are probably more familiar with her uh, cutting edge research on ceramic distributions in the Southwest and far Northwest Mexico. Having worked in Chihuahua, she has done some really great work with our ceramics. And so it's a great pleasure and a treat to have tonight's talk, which is early Mesoamerican ceremonial complexes and Olmec, my interaction. So I hope all of you are pleased uh, for tonight's talk. Take it over, folks. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'd like to thank Paul and, and Fran for the kind invitation. So today I'd like to talk about our recent uh, research in Southern Mexico. Uh, I'm going to uh, give this talk, but as you see, this is the co-authored presentation, co-authored with Daniela Triada, and then also this research was done by uh, lots of people, including our colleagues of our project. So let me share the screen. So, um, Many people know about the Maya civilization. Uh, particularly Maya civilization is known for the really uh, elaborate buildings and the elaborate uh, sculptures. Many of them date to so-called classic period. That's about 80, 80, uh, 300 to 8900. For example, this uh, famous temple from Tikal dates to 8th century, and then this beautiful carving from Copan dates also to 8th century. But the question I'd like to address today is the, how this remarkable civilization emerged uh, at the beginning. To study this, we have to go back in time and then uh, we have to look at much earlier period. So to the origin of my civilization are found probably in this period, 1200 to 400 BC. And then uh, during this time, many important things happens. People started to use ceramics, and then people probably started to use more maize uh, cultivation. And then sedentary villages started to develop in various parts of the Maya area. But particularly important change that happened during this period include this establishment of commonly held worldviews that really defines the important part of Maya culture. And then this worldview probably brought people together and then made this civilization possible. And then in terms of archeology, span we see this worldview reflected in symbolism uh, presented in various material culture, including architecture, layout of cities, and then sculpture. And then particularly important part of this symbolism is the representation of space and time. And then in this talk, I'd like to talk about uh, the particularly those two topics. So when we talk about the representation of Maya worldview, important aspect is that this Maya city as a cosmogram, 
which means that the Maya settlement and city really represented their worldview uh, in terms of space and time. In this sense, a famous example is the so-called e-group. In this famous example of the site of Washington from Guatemala, you have this e-group. E-group consists of this Western pyramid and then Eastern long mound. In case of Washington, it has three buildings on top of it. Washington is famous because this E group is exactly aligned to important as sun, uh, direction of sunrise on certain days. Center is aligned to the equinox sunrise, and then this side ones aligned to uh, solstices uh, sunrise. So there are some important meaning. But uh, I should say that this example from uh, Washington is a little bit late. Uh, that's the time period Maya civilization is already pretty well established. So we're gonna look at a period before this. Then what we're gonna see is that the RDE group, we see RDE group, but that they are not necessarily aligned to equinox and the solstices sunlight. Instead, some of them may be aligned to sunrise tied to Zenith passage day. That's a date that the sun goes really directly above us. Uh, usually happens May 19th, May 9th uh, in this part of the world. I'll come back to this point uh, as we go on. So let me give you just general uh, geographic, uh, the temporary background. So this is a Maya Lowland. And today it's Guatemala, Mexico, Belize, and then a little bit of Honduras. And then we'll be talking about another important civilization, Olmec civilization which was very important as we think about the origin of, of Maya civilization. We'll talk about the various sites from Maya area. We have worked at Sebal and the Agua de Phoenix. Then we we'll talk about its relation with Olmec centers of San Lorenzo and La Venta. In terms of chronology, as I said, Washington is a little bit later. That's a time period uh, Maya civilization was already established. Uh, we worked Sebal and Agua, Agua de Phoenix because we thought those are early site. Sebal dates to about 1000 BC. Agua de Phoenix is even older. But some Olmec center is even earlier. San Lorenzo dates to 1400 BC. And then after San Lorenzo collapsed, another Olmec center of La Venta came up around 800 BC. So that's about the time period we are talking about. Uh, in addition to our research at those sites, I'll, I'll talk about the result of our LIDAR survey. That's an airborne laser uh, mapping survey. What we did was we covered this large area of 85,000 square kilometers, which covered Western part of Maya Lowland and then almost entire Olmec area, which gives a really important information about this question. Let me give you the, our conclusion first. So the about this question of origin of Maya worldview and the spatial temporal symbolisms, important questions are when those things emerged and then become recognizable, and then where those things emerged. About the question of when, our conclusion would be that happened early to middle formative period. That's the time period that we talked about since the emergence of San Lorenzo to the uh, period of Agua de Phoenix, Ceibal, and La Venta. 
in terms of question of where uh, those things probably emerged in what we call the greater Ismian region. So it was not just Maya, it was not just the Olmec either. It also includes this Pacific coast area. So in this area, various group, including Maya, Olmec, and the other people are living. And then they did uh, pretty intense interaction and exchanged idea. And then through this process of interaction, this new worldview and the new representation of worldview emerged during this period. To think about this question, we need to look at a little bit of the history of research. Particularly important uh, theory was presented by John Clark. Uh, he noticed that uh, um, uh, Laventa had a very formalized uh, this site plan, uh, which, uh, which was arranged this along the north-south uh, axis. And then in the center, you have this E group. And then those mounds are arranged along this north-south axis. So John Clark uh, named this pattern middle formative chapas pattern. Here in short, as he called it MFC pattern. Interesting thing is the similar pattern are found all along this central Chiapas and then some part of uh, Pacific coast. For example, this site of Chiapas de Coso also has an E group and then has pyramid and then mound are arranged along the north south uh, line. So John Clark originally thought that this kind of representation of wild view were first developed at the Olmec center of La Venta, and then went through Chiapas and then came all the way to Maya area. But as I said before, probably now we have a little bit different understanding, but this view was probably very important uh, in terms of the debate. Also interesting is that uh, those center with um, middle formative Chiapas pattern uh, shared uh, also a particular type of ritual practice, which are reflected in those ritual deposits. Um, La Venta and Chiapas de Coso on the other side has those caches, uh, which contained many um, a green stone axes arranged in a specific way. Chiapas de Coso also had those axes. So those people, this pattern tells you that those people shared also ritual practice and then probably belief and the concept of world view behind them. So with that theory that the presented by John Clark, we looked at this site of Sebao and then we saw that there's an interesting pattern. Seibal was well known um, because it was studied by Harvard University in the 60s, and then they made this beautiful map. And then most of the building in this map dates to a classic period. But we thought that this pattern reflect its original design with E group in the center, and then probably Ari Mound buried under those later building. So this pattern is similar to La Venta and other uh, middle formative Chiapas pattern with all those uh, mounds arranged along the north-south axis. So uh, our excavation focused on those buildings to check whether those buildings really had those early versions. Uh, which represented Ari E group and then Ari mounds. So we did tunnel excavation like this, and then um, this kind of tunnel excavation. And then we found the hardest version of building, which is this one, which was pretty low building, but which tells us that the, this building represented the original 
uh, E group. In a reconstruction, probably it looks like this. This is the later building covering original E group with Western Mount and the Eastern Long Mount. Then we got the uh, uh, radiocarbon dates. After rejecting some bad date, more state concentrate on this date around uh, 950 BC. So that's the beginning of uh, Sebao, and then that's the beginning of this pattern. So RDST group probably looked like this. And then now we know that this was the focus of communal ritual because we found lots of caches, like those caches found at La Venta and then Chiapas site. Many of those caches had those green stone axes organized in a particular way. So this really shows that Sebao had a really uh, con close contact with Chiapas and then possibly with Olmec area. And then this is the view of uh, one of the cache with some beautiful, those uh, jade object. Another interesting find at Sebao came with LIDAR. So LIDAR came toward the end of our project at Sebao. So Harvard researchers made this map, this, which is very good map, but uh, this part, so those are buildings. Building seems to sit on this sort of little bit modified natural landscape. And then this landscape is depicted in a sort of amorphous shape. But when we did uh, LIDAR, uh, there's an important find. So this area looks like this, covered by trees. So to see those patterns in, on the ground is very hard. But when we did LIDAR, it looks like this. So actually, this part had a very well-designed, really nicely made uh, artificial plateau, which measured almost 600 meter north-south. So this was actually enormous, a very well-designed construction, which was supporting those pyramids and the E group. So these big buildings were built during the formative period, really at the beginning of the history of Seibao. And then in this part, central part, as I said, there's an E group. And then we look at the, this uh, direction, which is about seven degree atmos from the north. And then that aligns to March 3rd uh, sunrise, which really doesn't align well to any specific day, or it doesn't align to uh, equinox day. So at the beginning, I was a little bit skeptical about this view that the uh, E group are aligned to specific uh, uh, sunrise direction on certain days. But later I changed that mind. So uh, Seibao dates to about a 950. Important point is that the La Venta didn't become major center around until uh, 800 uh, BC. So Seibao E group were built before La Venta became, became important center. So that tells us that the, this pattern didn't come from La Venta, as John originally said. Uh, to be fair with John Clark, uh, John Clark also changed idea later on. And then he agrees that actually La Venta was not the origin of this pattern. Then question is, what is the origin? I'm not saying that the Seibao was the origin of that pattern. Then to study that, we thought we need to look at this area. So there are those sites in Chiapas, but we didn't know much about this part of Tabasco in Mexico. So we went to this area, uh, this middle Usmacinta area in 2017. And then we formed a new project. And then these are the, our colleagues. And then 
uh, people who helped us uh, in the group uh, there in Mexico. And then uh, also we have uh, this taco place in Mexico uh, with my name now. So if I lose my university job, maybe I go to Mexico and then work in this taco place. The most uh, surprising find in Mexico was this site of Agua de Phoenix. This is an enormous site, but the uh, people didn't know about this site before our research. That's because this is a big building, but it was horizontally big. This is the view of Agua de Phoenix. This is actually enormous plateau, but if you walk there, it just looks like anything. It looks like a just part of natural landscape. But when you do look at uh, LIDAR, you see that the, this is a really well-designed, enormous construction. Actually, this plateau measures 1.4 kilometer long, almost a mile. It's a in huge, huge construction. Then it's a little bit similar to middle formative Chiapas pattern with E group in the center. But the characteristic thing is really this well-defined um, rectangular pattern. So we de decided to call it middle formative Usmacinta pattern, MFU pattern. And then also interestingly, uh, this plateau uh, is connected with those uh, causeways and the avenue to the south, north, and then to the west. And then to the west, we have another big platform. To see the history of construction, we did a uh, deep excavation like this. We had to show up um, our uh, pit as we go deeper. And then eventually we reached the eight uh, depths of eight meter. We went through this layer of beautiful clay with different colors. And then we reached at the bottom uh, bedrock eventually at the depths of eight meter. There we found this accumulation of uh, medium. Then again, we took a radiocarbon date. Each of these represent a one radiocarbon date. This medium date about 1200 BC, it already had ceramics. So it's really bit earlier than Seibao. We don't have dates from this area. Around this part dates to about 1000 BC. So this construction might, must be slightly earlier than Seibao's construction. Then top part of platform dates to 800 BC. So this whole thing was built in a relatively short time period of few, chance, few centuries. So this research actually tells us that actually this plateau, artificial plateau, was the largest building ever built in the history of Maya area. And then this is also the oldest um, uh, ceremonial construction uh, in the Maya area that's confirmed so far. And then we also checked this E group then as we expected, we found this cache, again with this jade and the greenstone artifacts, including this very well-shaped um, pointed object. Also interesting thing is that the, this building, this plateau has those edge platforms. Each of platform is pretty big. And then here we have five, 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 20 in total. And as you may know, 20 is the base unit of Mesoamerican math mathematics and the calendar. So this is probably not the coincidence. That's probably a symbolic representation of Maya time and the world view uh, materialized in this enormous building. 
And interesting thing is that we see those small mound, which is aligned to its E group. And then farther to the west, we see this weird T-shaped building. Those are aligned and then that seems to define certain direction. That's 11 degree from the uh, true north. That correspond to February 19th sunrise. Interestingly, that's uh, 80 days before Zena's passage day. So again, 80 is the base unit, 80 days is four times 20 days. So this might be a meaningful thing. So as I said, uh, this pattern was first uh, theorized by Tony Avini and Dowd and the Binding. They said that the important date is Zena's passage days. So Zena's passage day is May 9th or 10th. On this day, the sun in the midday goes really top of, on, of people uh, directly above us. Then 20 days before is the April 20th, uh, 40 days before is March 31st, and the 80 days before is February 19th. Uh, Avini checked various E group, and then this is the histogram of that frequency with that direction. What he shows is that the many of those E group were aligned to do this specific sunrise direction, which is away from this Zenas passage day, either from 20 days, 40 days, 60 days, or 80 days. So this seems to be an uh, intentional arrangement. And then Aguada Phoenix follows this pattern. In addition, we have small uh, mound here and then here, which defines the north-south direction. And then, so this kind of directionality seems to have been very important for the builder of Aguada Phoenix. Then we did that this LIDAR survey here of the 85,000 square kilometer. So this is a huge area. Uh, you can see that before this research, um, various people did LIDAR in Maya area. Those are individual previous LIDAR research in Maya area. You can see in comparison how big uh, this area is. Then we did find uh, lots of sites similar to Aguada Phoenix. Uh, or many of those red uh, building, uh, red sites has similar rectangular arrangement. And then those purple one has uh, arrangement similar to La Venta and then other sites. And then most of those sites uh, similar to Aguada Phoenix were not known before. And then those pattern as you see, spread to this Omec area, past La Venta and San Lorenzo too. So we did find 40, uh, 478 formative those standardized complex, including MFC pattern like La Venta. Uh, MFG is very similar to La Venta and Chiapa de Coso. And, uh, this should be MFU, which is similar to Aguada Phoenix. And there's other little bit similar, slightly different pattern. And then this is just a little bit irregular rectangular pattern. And then we have this kind of square pattern too. So all of those must be related. And then this area is really covered with this kind of pattern standardized complexes, but uh, because many of them are relatively flat, most of those sites were not known until we did this LIDAR survey in this area. Uh, let me look at some of those examples. One of the, them is this Buena Vista here, relatively close, close to Agoda Phoenix. Phoenix. Again, it has a rectangular formation with E group and then 20 edge platform like e, uh, Aguada Phoenix. Again, it has those small mound 
defining east-west direction. In this case, that aligns to March 12th, which is uh, six days away from Zenas passage days. So it's based on same principle. Again, those small mound defines north south axis. So this kind of direction is very important. And then in this part, you see subtle grid like pattern. Then we check the direction of most of those sites. And then this triangle shows their directions. It looks like a kind of mess, but you see some pattern. If you see a histogram, the highest uh, frequency is February 19th, 80 day off from Zenas passage day, like Agua de Phoenix. If you see it more closely, so this is 80 days off. This should be 60 days off, which is better be off, but uh, that may, um, the intention might be uh, disalignment. Uh, this is 40 days off. Again, it has a peak and then 100 days off another peak. So this seems to be following the pattern, but some cases they just don't have enough flat land and then they had to adjust uh, those complexes to this available land and then those are a little bit off this pattern. Another interesting thing is that uh, uh, many of those complex uh, in this flat land without any residential remains. This is a small, again, rectangular shape with tiny E group in the center. But you don't see this any residential building, which makes us think that uh, during this period, people are still moving around. They didn't build in substantial residences. This pattern becomes clear if when we look at the classic period later built, uh, site, like uh, this case of El Saruguato. This had uh, this uh, MFU pattern here probably during the formative period. Then it continued to be occupied and then continues on to this classic period. And then this Acropolis and then this fortified uh, center dates to classic period. And then in this case, you see lots of those dots. Those are all residential buildings. All those classic uh, site has lots of those residences, but the early site don't have those uh, visible residences, which really tells us that they lived in a relatively a female building and then they moved a lot. This is another site, El Macabillo. Again, rectangular shape, almost kilometer long center. In the center, you have E group and then 20 edge platform. Again, in this case, this is a huge a complex, but you don't see residential buildings. And then you see again, a subtle grid pattern here on the side of this complex. Then where does this pattern come from? Uh, John Clark said the uh, origin was La Venta. Now we know that the La Venta is not the origin. Then important site is the sun, uh, site of San Lorenzo. That's the Ari Omex Center. But many people thought, most people thought San Lorenzo has co had completely different site arrangement. It was originally studied by uh, Michael Cole, and then this is the map of San Lorenzo. Uh, this is a huge plateau, uh, which measures more than a kilometer long. And then this plateau is dotted by this huge uh, colossal head sculpture uh, for which uh, this site is famous. So this is a plateau, but it looks like a most fast shape. Uh, Co originally proposed that, that this represent a giant bird, but most people think that's not the case. Then they didn't really recognize, most people didn't recognize it, but the San Lorenzo too should have probably this edge platform. In this map made by Cole and the other people, 
those slightly high places are mapped in contact uh, lines, but they didn't really name them or recognize them as, as edge plateaus, edge platforms. But if you see it, actually there are 20 of edge platforms, just like Aguada Phoenix. Then when we analyze this uh, site uh, with LIDAR, you see that those edge platforms are much uh, regular, much as regular shape with this rectangular shape with straight edge here. So actually, so those things are very hard to see if you are standing on the ground because each of them are big and then people tend to map them in those amorphous shape. But in LIDAR, you see that this is a really a regular shape which defined this rectangular plaza in the center, just like Aguada Phoenix. But it has probably, that some part was probably uh, eroded with in the radar uh, process. So San Lorenzo actually had the pattern very similar to Aguada Phoenix in terms of the shape of plaza and then in terms of these 20 edge platforms. Also, we noticed a, a different similarity. Actually, Agatha Phoenix has this, uh, those avenues, uh, which, is, which looked pretty strange at the beginning. But we realized that the San Lorenzo also had the same pattern. Actually, access to San Lorenzo Plateau are those ridges two access from the north, two from the south, actually that, that's a continuation here, and then two main access from the west. From the west. Actually, probably Aguada Phoenix followed by the pattern, two ac main access from the west, two from north, two from south. So really, Aguada Phoenix was a little bit later than San Lorenzo, and then that means that the, this template was made at San Lorenzo and the Aguada Phoenix was modeled after San Lorenzo. But there's an important difference. Aguada Phoenix has this E group, but San Lorenzo doesn't have E group. And then to think about this pattern, uh, we can look at La Venta and the Pajonal uh, La Venta again. And then there's another site uh, very similar to La Venta, which is called Pajonal. If we see this pattern, uh, people really didn't recognize this. People thought that uh, San Lorenzo and La Venta are very different. But uh, La Venta has 10 edge flap platform on this side. And then this side is a little bit different. But uh, Pajon, we, if we look at Pajonal, Pajonal is basically a copy of La Venta, smaller copy of La Venta, uh, similar building, uh, uh, color-coded uh, two sites. In the center, you have E group. In case of Pajonal, you have 20 edge platform. We have to wonder, early version of La Venta may have had 20 edge platform. So La Venta also followed this pattern with rectangular plaza and then 10 or possibly 20 edge platforms. So then question is where did E group come from? I'm not saying Aguada Phoenix is the origin of uh, E group. Actually, I think E group came from Ojo de Agua. Uh, this well, basically this southern Pacific coast area. Uh, particularly important site is this Ojo de Agua, which is partially contemporaneous with San Lorenzo and Agua de Phoenix, dates to about 1100 BC. Uh, this was studied by uh, Hodges, Hodgson and Clark and the, uh, Gaya, Emiliano Gallaga. And then this is the map of the site. At this point, the formation of Igru was not established 
and the MFC pattern was not established yet. But that, this seems to represent prototype for E group, this Eastern Rogue mound. And then in this case, you have two mounds here. And then you have Northern mound and then large platform here. here. So this may be a prototype for MFC pattern. The interesting thing is that, that they have this Northern pyramid. If we see various uh, Pacific coast site of this period, formative period, many of them are aligned to volcanoes that's on the Northern side of those sites. <coughs> For example, this site of Isapa, uh, aligned to this Takana volcano. Another Pacific site, uh, La Branca, is aligned to Tafmulco volcano. Another site, Takarika Baf, is aligned to this volcano of Siete Orejas. So those sites, this is Isapa, has this northern pyramid. So original part of Isapa is here, again aligned along the north-south axis. And then in the north, you have pyramid. So this pyramid must be a representation of volcano built within this uh, site, with, within this settlement. And then that's aligned to natural volcano. So when we look at La Venta and Pafnao, they also have Northern Pyramid, but to the north of those sites is just a flat plain and the ocean. Uh, there's nothing to align to. But so this makes me think that the, they must have copied, those people at La Venta must have copied this original pattern from the Pacific Coast people. So probably Pacific Coast are the origin of this kind of north-south alignment. And then this E group and the Northern Pyramid, which were also adapted in this Olmec area. Then where those element, when those element comes to Maya area, we are not sure Aguada Phoenix could be occupied by Maya people, but we are not completely sure. So Seibar is important, but uh, Washakutu is later, as I said. But then when we think about the spread of this pattern in Maya area, important site is this site of Nishtun Tech, which was studied by Timothy Pugh and the Blue Rice. This is the map of uh, Nishtun Tech made by Pugh and Rice. Uh, this site has those multiple E groups. And then interestingly, they have main access two main access axes, access from the north, two from the south, and then two from the west, which is really the pattern uh, followed, uh, pattern came from Aguada Phoenix and San Lorenzo. This site is slight, little bit later than those sites. But interestingly, Nistun Teach emphasize more this east-south axis rather than north-south axis of this area period. And then this pattern goes on to Maya area, some of this area, this e emphasis on east-west uh, axis. For example, this site of Tikal emphasizes this east-west axis, and then uh, they have E group here. And then many of those sites like a Tikal in the Maya area dropped other elements of MFU or MFC pattern and then just took E group and then come to really emphasize this east west axis. So then that became the common pattern in the Maya area, like this site of Washaktun in later period. So let me summarize uh, this pattern. So early model 
came, some model came from San Lorenzo, particularly this 20 edge platform and then rectangular plaza uh, with uh, this north-south alignment. Another element came from Pacific Coast. And there they had the north-south alignment aligned to volcanoes. And then they probably had the ARIA E group. And then probably they had the prototype of MFC para. The Aguada Phoenix combined those elements on this rectangular platform from San Lorenzo and then E group from a Pacific coast. And then Seibao Turk, also E group from Pacific coast. And then some of this construction of plateau from Aguada Phoenix and San, San Lorenzo and the MFC arrangement, possibly from Pacific Coast and then other uh, Chiapas site. Then Agua de, uh, La Venta actually came later. So La Venta was not the origin of this pattern, but the La Venta probably took those elements developed by various different people and then uh, really the completed the MFC and the MFG pattern. Then some of those elements, particularly E group, were adopted by various uh, Maya groups. And then they came to emphasize in some area, this equinox uh, alignment instead of Aria, uh, Zena's passage day related to uh, related alignment. So this pattern shows that uh, all those development didn't just happen in one origin, not just the Olmec area, not just Maya, not just Pacific coast, but the various area, various group made uh, important contributions and then they interacted with each other and then exchanged idea. And then this kind of worldview and then symbolic system were established and then shared in this uh, Ismian area, Southern uh, Mesoamerica. Many of Maya centers came a little bit late and then selectively adapted this area established element, particularly E group. Then this kind of element continues on to classic period. So this kind of shared uh, belief and the shared practices of ritual became really the foundation of Maya area. And then that's the very, that became important factor to bring people together and then coordinate people's action for the development of uh, civilization and then bigger society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Takeshi. That was that was very interesting. Um, I do have one question starting off, and uh, sure. mm -hmm. those of you watching, um, you know, feel free to put your questions in the Q and A box. Um, the first question is: Are the volcano arrangements of the Pacific Coast presaging the Wits iconography of the Maya? Yes, and that's a great question. Uh, in Maya language, which means the mountain or hill, and then uh, there are lots of representation with or hill, and then in Maya lowland, uh, pyramids are really uh, representation of those mountains. But in the Maya lowland, we don't you don't have volcanoes, and then um, we are not sure. Well, that they preside certainly this pattern. And then Pacific Coast, those pyramids are area. And then in case of Pacific Coast, really those pyramids are modeling those natural volcanoes. Mm -hmm. And then this concept of pyramid came to Maya Lorand a little bit later on. And then we don't know if they were thinking about volcano at that point or they were probably thinking more about cast hills that present 
uh, in their own area. But certainly importance of mountain uh, really shared across those areas. Great, great. Um, have you visited the sites that you saw under the LIDAR? Um, if so, are the features physically identified? Uh, we did some of them, but uh, many of those sites don't have those tall buildings. So people may have known about the central mound, but the really those rectangular pattern were not recognized. Those rectangular pattern was really defined by very low mound. And then these rectangular patterns are huge horizontally. So if you stand there, you really never see this rectangular pattern unless you see this rider. So that's the uh, really the pattern we are getting with the LIDAR, yes. Good. Um, let's see, how are the construction workers organized like a volunteer group or are they specialized workers? I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. Danny, do you wanna answer that question? Yeah, we have not very much evidence for any type of social differentiation of this time period. So we think that people came together voluntarily and were basically buying into the ideology and the cosmology at that time. They probably came together periodically because we have several construction episodes at Aguada Phoenix. Um, but this is actually one of the key questions because we are looking into larger frameworks of how social complexity developed in many parts of the world. And we don't see any evidence for coercion. We think it's voluntary. We think these people contributed and kind of built community with these huge construction projects. How and who sold them on this? I have no idea because it is absolutely ginormous. I mean, this the construction is mind boggling. Even now that we know that this thing exists, I'm there. And every time I'm on top of this major rectangular platform of Aguada Phoenix, I'm like, what were these people thinking? What were these people smoking? It took forever probably to do it. So enormous, enormous labor input. Um, and we do think that these people came together and did it basically all together as a community. I'm sure there were some people who were organizing. There must've been somebody who had this template and then basically related it to people. I mean, there must have been a plan because the pattern is so clear. But the exact organization of this labor force, we are still not very sure how this happened. Okay, good. Um, this one is from a former student of yours, Elizabeth Kuhn Nugent. Um, hello, Dr. Inamata and Dr. Triadam from Texas, one of your former students. I went with you as an undergrad from Yale in the summer of 97. Enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Hmm. <laughs> Are you remembering? You're, you're muted, Daniela. Danny, you're muted. I said, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, next question. Did the Pacific Coast sites have a particular item or items that were trading with the Olmec and early formative Maya? Um, Pacific Coast, that's not too clear. Uh, southern part of uh, uh, Chiapas, and they were trading uh, illuminite, uh, this mi uh, mineral. Uh, well, we don't know what they were using it for exactly, but the tons of them are at San Lorenzo. And then San Lorenzo pro people probably came to Pacific Coast. And the reason is not too clear um, one possibility is that the Pacific Coast is uh, uh, really an important production area of cacao. Um, Mesoamerican people really valued cacao drink, which is another one possibility. And then also the, those volcanoes have obsidian. It's not the Pacific Coast, but the volcanoes are close to the Pacific Coast. And then obsidian was important. Um, that's another possibility, yes. Well, I also uh, should mention Jade. Yeah. Jade comes from the Motagua Valley in Guatemala. So that's not directly on the coast, but all these greenstone axes, the source for them 
is the Motagua Valley in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, we don't, well, we don't know yet. We haven't actually looked at LIDAR from that year. Yeah, but we haven't actually found any sites that look like the ones that Takeshi was showing mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for, the, for the Gulf Coast. Okay, um, do you have an estimate of how many people lived at these sites? Do you want to talk about it then? Well, first of all, we don't think that they lived there um, year round. Um, and, but we do think that there were hundreds, if not thousands, of people involved in these construction events and also probably rituals that took time. So the in the area from where people were drawn, for instance, to Aguala Phoenix, which really was the central site at that time and was the biggest site. Um, the most monumental one of all of these in the middle of the area um, could have been hundreds of kilometers to some degree. We, we are not quite sure what population densities were at this time. Um, could be relatively high, but we think that the people were mostly mobile and they were really moving around this landscape and, and um, exploiting a lot of the aquatic resources in these, in these flat um, delta-like areas. Great. All right, let's see. Were the stone artifacts in the caches used or were they created solely for the purpose to be ritual? Go ahead, Tani. That's a great question. Um, at Sebal, our colleague, Dr. Kazuo Aoyama did use her analysis on some of these axes. We had a, a lot of caches there as the cache was showing um, and some of them were used and also reworked. Um, the ones, the one cache so far that we have from Maguana Phoenix also kind of looks to me as if they may have reused pieces. Mm -hmm. They're smaller, um, and so they may have used some of those, but then we also have this very nice um, pointed instrument that's very well polished. Some people call it a perforator, which is by, almost identical to uh, one that we found at Seval in one of the caches. This one was broken. So it may have been in use and then deposited in the cache because it was a it was an important um, object. But the value of these objects is pretty clear um, because in Sebal we also have um, a cache that has a has pendants. I mean, so-called spoon pendants that are Olmec in style and that you find in Olmec sites. So this is a personal ornament that basically was then dedicated in one of these caches, which also and Seval shows us that there may have been some ritual specialists and we're just starting potentially to see a little bit of social differentiation. Great, thanks. Um, do you see any connections between the Maya of the time periods you, study, you studied and the contemporary Maya period groups, the, the groups, their distribution, their rituals and ceremonies or simply their relationships to each other? And thank you so much for your work in this presentation. So do you see any connections between the the ancients and um, more contemporary descendants? Yes, uh, certainly. Um, Maya people are remarkably stable. Uh, they, they've been in this area for thousands of years. And uh, other Mesoamerican people very much moved around, but the Maya people are very uh, fixed in this area. And uh, we are doing a DNA analysis of the, from Sebal. We want to do that Aguada Phoenix too. When we look at the Sebal data and DNA data, there's a very strong connection to later Maya people. So really the direct ancestor of Maya people were living uh, in this area. Just the Aguada Phoenix, it's a little bit to the west we are not completely sure if they were Maya people, but they share a very similar ceramics with the rest of Maya area, and then possibly Aguada Phoenix uh, were occupied by Maya speakers, but uh, it's not too clear. If we go farther to the West, we don't know. Some people, well, common theory is that the Olmec people were Mihesokian speakers. And then Chiapas may have been Mihesokian speakers, but it's not too clear. Mm -hmm. See, so in this sense, there is a 
very strong connection uh, to their descendant in each of those areas. Mm -hmm. And their rituals and ceremonies, do you know anything about that? Are they connected as well? Yes, so this um, 20, number 20, mm -hmm. is uh, really the, uh, we start to see in this period and then go, uh, becomes very clear in the classic period. And then this pattern continues on to today. Some Maya groups uh, keep this traditional calendar based on this 20 number system. And then some of the ritual uh, probably changed, but uh, uh, this important of, importance of direction, particularly this four directional uh, symbolism is very important in modern Maya people. And um, in the, among the Maya, modern Maya people, this ritual tied to maize is very important. But this is um, the, when we look at this early period, that's a time period maize just became important. And then so really this kind of uh, symbolism and uh, religious belief while well, really emerging during this time period. And then after that, it continues on very strongly. Great, thanks. Um, uh, have you, do you have or have found any evidence of a temple room similar to those identified at San Jose Mogote and interpreted as house men? Hmm. Annie, do you wanna take it? <laughs> I, all I can say is no, <laughs> no, we haven't. Um, but I should emphasize that the whole, that all of these complex, complexes are ritual. They're ideological. I mean, they are a ritual landscape. They are not built, right? They are not, um, as far as we know at the moment, um, buildings like that are domestic dwellings. So these, these standardized layouts basically represent the cosmology of the people at that point that are intricately linked to rituals and, and beliefs. E-groups were clearly used for rituals um, the plazas were used because we have these deposits and they actually go on and say, well, we have cash deposits that go, that start around 950 BC and they go all the way into what we call the proto-classic, which is around 280. And they continue, we have, at Seibal, we have a continuous occupation that's almost 2000 years into the terminal classic and the people continue to use the focus of this, the, the central axis of the e-group. So the e-group is, is kind of key for some of these rituals. Um, we didn't see any, there are no rooms in the sense that people are inside. I think most of these rituals are, are taking place outside and these rectangular spaces that are created are enormous. You could have thousands of people who come together for rituals and potentially also feasts. Um, that are congregating and pretty open. So the access on these platforms is pretty open through these kind of ramps that may have been also used in ceremonies. Good. Did you mention limonite as a trading stone? Ilmenite. Uh, Ilmenite. Ilmenite. It's like, okay. uh, yeah, the very hard, yeah, iron based uh, ore, yes. They make a cube uh, in San Lorenzo and then make holes. And then there are some various theories why they did it, but uh, there's no definite answer. There are really tons of them. It's huge amount at San Lorenzo. Yes. Of the sites that you have visited, did you find any glyphics, glyphs? glyphics that were similar among the sites? Any progressions of complexity in any any progressions of complexity in any of them found? Um, in our area, we haven't found any glyphs. And then during this period, we don't have any of those glyphs. Slightly later, uh, about the time period of La Venta, we start to have stone sculptures representing people and then possibly deity. They are not really a glyphs, but um, in that sense, 
it's similar to later uh, Stira, which has glyphs. Now, when we talk about La Venta, some of La Venta monuments have early form of glyphs. And then San Lorenzo, we are not sure. There's uh, this uh, strange uh, uh, block uh, called the Cascajar block, which seems to come from San Lorenzo period. And then there's a series of signs, but uh, uh, connection to later glyph is not too clear. But during the time of the La Venta, that's after 800 BC, there's a pretty rich iconography. And then they were using probably the early form of glyphs uh, by that time. Good, okay, I think there's one more here and um, we'll take one more. Are any of these physical features of the studied sites found at the Mayan sites in Belize? Are they similar? Uh, in those in Belize, not too much. Um, well, not at the moment. We have E groups that seem to be relatively early, but mm -hmm. not as early, not as early as as Aguada Phoenix. So about the Belize site, um, there are some site with E groups. Um, the, their dates, their beginning are not clear. And then some of the early building at the uh, Betty's, uh, they are a little bit different from E-group in my view. Some, want, some people want to call it, call them E-group. Um, but so, but uh, they, those early building at Betty's also seems to emphasize those three part uh, organization central building and then two building on the side and then in that sense it's a little bit similar to e-group and then certainly e-group come to Betty's later on and then in those early period there seems to be two cultural sphere in the Maya area uh, this eastern part like a Belize and then western part like Agua de Phoenix Aguada Phoenix had a stronger connection with Olmec. Uh, Belize had a stronger connection with uh, Honduras and the other areas. And then their cultural element is a little bit different. Ceramics are different too. Mm -hmm. So uh, originally there are so those little bit different cultural spheres and then it gradually they merged to form more uniform uh, Maya cultural sphere. Okay, there's a couple of comments. Um, Gilbert Garboot, Garbut or Garboot um, is asking, how about Luban Tun? I don't know where that is. Is that? That's yeah. in Belize. Belize. Yes. Yeah, I figured that, yeah. Luban Tun is a later site, mostly classic period. And uh, I'm not sure if it, uh, I don't know about the uh, pre-classic component. Uh, Belize has lots of sites, uh, many of classic period sites, but they also have early uh, pre-classic sites. And then Belize also have uh, archaic sites, and then um, probably in that sense, um, Belize was in another important area to think about the origin of my civilization. But most of the earlier sites where we have early structures are in the Belize Valley. Belize River Valley, um, Jaime Awe and Kat Brown have been working there, and um, Lisa, Lisa, um, oh, the gosh, I'm blanking. LeCount. Le, Lisa LeCount, yes. And they actually have been digging, and they have e groups that are identified, identifiable on the ground. Somebody mentioned Chumantanich. Um, and then they have been actually digging into these groups and trying to get some dates. So they are, they have earlier um, versions of these. They date to the middle pre-classic, but so far the dates are not as early as what we're seeing in, in the West. For these particular constructions, I should say, uh, than what we what we're seeing in the what, what the Kesh mentioned in the in the Western area. Well I think that's it for this evening. Uh, I want to just really thank you immensely. That was really, really interesting. And um, we really appreciate your giving us your time this evening. 
Um, and thank everyone you. out there, thank you very much for joining us. And we will see you again in October. Our pleasure. Uh, Thanks for having us. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.